I remember when learning about RIP and OSPF and EAGRP that they supported equal cost load balancing. And I thought, that's great. Equal cost load balancing. What does it mean? Well, it means that if R1 has five equal cost paths, there's a potential that it could use all of those paths to forward traffic. That's great. Well, what are some of the things that we want to remember about OSPF? Well, OSPF has a maximum equal cost path factor of four by default. So let's take these, this network right here. We have R1, R2, and R3. And what we're going to do is verify that we have OSPF neighborships. R1 ends in dot one, R2 ends in dot two, R3 ends in dot three. And all of these sub interfaces have been created on each of the routers, R1 and R2. So let's verify that those interfaces are up. Simple to do. Show IP interface brief. And sure enough, those interfaces are up. And if we want to do a ping over to 10.0.0.2, that works as well. Let's verify OSPF to show IP OSPF interface brief. That'll verify which interfaces have been enabled for OSPF. And let's just take one sample. Here's FA00.50, a sub interface. It's a member of OSPF process ID 1. That interface has been assigned to OSPF area 0. There's the IP address assigned to that interface. There's the OSPF cost for that interface. And currently, we are a BDR, a backup designated router. Why? It's because R2 is a designated router. And that could be because R2 came up first. In fact, let's just verify that. Show IP OSPF neighbors. It could be because R2 came up first, or if they both came up at the same time, they were duking it out. It could be because R2 has a higher router ID, which it does. R2 has a router ID of 2222. R1 has a router ID of 1111, and as a result, that could also have been the tie break there. So we have OSPF neighborships on each of these interfaces. Now check this out. Let's do a show IP route, and instead of looking at all the routes, let's just look at the routes that have been learned from OSPF. And here's the single route. Well, I should say the single network that we've learned is the 23 network. That's right here. And R1 says, oh, I've learned about that four different ways, or is it more? Let's take a look. It says, I know how to get to that network, 23, using 40.0.0.2 as the next top with that exit interface, using 30.0.0.2, 20.0.0.2, and 10.0.0.2. It didn't specify 50. Now, why is that? Why are we not able to go ahead and use 50? Well, the default equal cost load balancing is four equal cost paths. And anything higher than four simply isn't used by default. So the router chose which one he was going to ditch because we literally have five equal cost paths to the 23 network. Now, let me demonstrate how you could verify this. This is also really important. Is R1 really going to load balance across those links? Check this out. If we do a trace route, and let's trace route to this IP address right here to 23.0.0.3. And normally with Traceroute, the way it works is this. We send out a UDP segment with a TTL of 1. And the router that gets that says, oh, TTL of 1, to route this, I'm going to cut it to 0. Oh, I killed your packet. And it forwards you an ICMP message saying I killed your packet. It sends three of those out with TTL of 1. And that's why we get three responses back. And then the router sends out three more with a TTL of 2. And that's how Traceroute operates. Instead of using the default of 3, I'm going to say I want the probe count to be five. Why? Because we have four equal cost paths. And if I just said three, it would use three and we wouldn't see it repeat. So by using five, it's going to use all four paths and it's going to start to repeat again. So there's our trace route. So the very first UDP segment it sent out was using this interface, the dot 40 with 40.2 as the next stop. And then it used the 30, and then the 20, and then the 10. And check this out right here at the bottom. It went ahead and it recycled one, two, three, four. Yeah, for the fifth one, it recycled. So it's using these four routes, even though there's actually five advertisements, five link states it knows about R1 of how to reach this 23 network, it picked four. Let's fix that problem right now. Let's go into configuration mode and we'll simply tell R1 that we want him to go ahead and use five equal cost paths if he has them available and not just limit it to the default, the default of four. So we go into router configuration mode for OSPF1 and say maximum paths five. That's it. 
And once we specify it's five, now if we do a show IP route OSPF, check this out. He'll automatically say, oh, now I have five routes instead of four that I can go ahead and use. So I'm going to scroll up just for a moment. See, just a moment ago, we had dot 10, 20, 30, and 40 being used. And now, because we set the max path to five, we have 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. Sounds great. Now, we also have another little challenge here that most of the time we need to fix in a current network, and that is this. Check this out. If we do a show IP OSPF interface brief, look at the cost. Now, the cost is the bandwidth of the interface. We're at 100 megabits per second divided into the reference bandwidth, which is also set to 100 megabits. And as a result, it's a value of one. Now, why is that a problem? Well, if everything is simply fast ethernet, it's not a problem. However, gigabit and 10 gigabit is out there. And unfortunately, from a cost perspective, fast ethernet is gonna look just as good as gigabit ethernet because it doesn't go any lower than a cost of one. With metrics, lower is better. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to just simply modify the reference bandwidth and change it from the default of 100 and change it to 1,000. Let me show you what I mean here. Let's go into, we're in router configuration mode, auto cost reference bandwidth 1,000. Now it says you should probably do this on all of your routers, but check this out. If we go back here and I do a question mark, we put the auto cost reference bandwidth in megabits per second. So... 1,000 megabits per second is one gig. The default is 100 megabits per second, which is fast ethernet, and that's why this came up to one. So if we do the same, that command again, show IP OSPF interface brief, you'll notice now that all our costs went to 10. And that's a good thing. Now gigabit is gonna look a lot better than fast ethernet. And that's important also to do that on all your routers. Because right now, R1 thinks that these links have a cost of 10, while R2 thinks that these links have a cost of one. So I'd wanna use that same command across the board. So let's go over to R2 just for a moment and change his auto cost reference as well. So we'll run over to R2 and on R2, we'll say, okay, your auto cost reference bandwidth is gonna be 1000 as well. And if I had 20 or 30 routers running OSPF in the same domain, I would configure all of them with the same exact auto cost reference bandwidth. Okay, so now that part's done. Let's go back over to R1. Now in R1, let's just verify that the changes we made are actually going to be meaningful here. Show IP OSPF interface brief. Okay, so our cost is 10. We have all of our neighborships. Let's do this. How do we make one or two of these interfaces look better than the others? Right now, they're all equal costs, so they're all being used. Why five? because our max paths has been set to five. So if we went in and we told interface FA00.10, this guy right here, that his cost of his interface was five, which would be a better cost, we would lose all of these routes, except for the one that was the best cost. If we did it for these two interfaces, if we said IP OSPF interface cost of five for .10 and .20, we would then have just those two paths being load balanced across. So let's go ahead and set those two interfaces up just as an example. So we'll go to interface configuration mode for FA00.10, specify IP OSPF cost is five, and that overrides the bandwidth on the interface from for the calculation perspective. Once you say it's five, it's five. This is the, the winner config, if you will. So it doesn't matter what we have for auto cost, reference bandwidth, or anything else for these two interfaces, they believe that the cost is five and that's it. So if we do a show IP OSPF interface again, let's go back up and do that. You'll notice the bottom two interfaces now have a cost of five. And if we do a show IP route for OSPF, it's gonna show us that just those two interfaces are being used. Why? What's wrong with 30, 40, and 50? Well, they don't look as good. They're fine you know routes but they're not the best cost to get to the final destination so when ospf runs its algorithm to find the best path the best path to the final destination it says well it's going to be these two interfaces dot 10 and dot 20 and these three interfaces the cost is too high they're not in the running so we're going to load balance now across dot 10 and dot 20. so that's really cool that's a lot of fun let's do a little experiment what would happen 
if I shut down these two interfaces. Let's do that right now. Let's just do a real quick show of the IP OSPF for the routes, which we just did, and we don't need to do it again. And let's shut down those two interfaces. And I want you to think about what we would expect to see. So we'll go into interface FA00.10 and shut it down, and FA00.20 and shut it down. Okay, so now that those two interfaces are shut down, what do we expect? Well, Keith, let's see. These two interfaces had a cost of five each, and they were both being used for load balancing. If we take them both down, then 30, 40, and 50 should now be the interface we'd use to reach the 23 network. And that's absolutely true, but I want to share with you something else that's happening behind the scenes. Just because we told R1 to shut down these two interfaces doesn't mean that R2 doesn't still know about them, and he does. So R2 is going to advertise the 10 network and the 20 network on links 30, 40, and 50. So R1 is going to have a whole bunch of new routes that just showed up as a result. Here was our old IP routes that we learned via OSPF. And let's do a show IP route OSPF now. <laughs> and here's our new ones. So let's focus on the network at hand. The 23 network is the network that we were focused on earlier. And indeed, we have three equal cost paths to get there. Interface 30, 40, and 50. Great, fantastic, no problem. But check this out. The 10 network, because R2 is still connected to it, he's advertising the link state advertisement saying, hey, I've got connectivity to 10. He's advertising them over these three interfaces to his good buddy R1 who says, oh, great, I've got reachability. I've got reachability to those networks, 10 and 20, through R2. And that's why we're receiving these additional routes that are coming in. And now what are we doing? Now we're doing equal cost load balancing to get to the 23 network using the three interfaces, 30, 40, 50. We're equal cost load balancing to get to the 20 network. Even though our, our local interface is disconnected, we can get there indirectly. And we can also get to the 10, 0, 0, 8, 10, 10, 0, 0 network through those same three interfaces. So what have we covered in this short tutorial? We've identified about equal cost load balancing. The maximum by default is four equal cost paths. So before we finish, let's do a little what if game. We've disabled FA00.10 and 20, but if we enable just dot 10, who has a interface cost of five, we'll do a show IP OSPF interface brief. So at the moment we have FA00.10, which is down. It has a cost of five. If we brought that one interface up, how would our routing table change? Let's do it. We'll go to interface FA0 slash 0.10. We'll do a no shutdown. And what I want you to do is think about just for a moment, what routes are we going to see? And the answer is, well, are we going to see this, these OSPF learn routes for the 10 network? The answer is no. This local 10 network, now that R1's connected, a directly connected route has a way better administrative distance than anything we're learning through OSPF. So all the OSPF learned routes, about 10, those are all going to disappear. Now for the 23 network, what are we going to see? Well, the 23 network is going to be best reachable through the FA00.10 interface that has the cost of five. So we're going to have a single route through FA00.10 because it's the only interface up that has a cost of five and the overall cost is going to be the best using that interface to get there. And then we'll still have these routes here for the 20 network. So the 20 network routes should still show up except they won't be shown as load cost balancing because to get to this 20 network, we're still going to use the interface that has the best cost overall to get there. And that's going to be this local interface FA00.10 because after all considerations, this interface has a better cost to get to the 20 network than 30, 40, and 50 because of the, the link state calculation of what the cost is to get there. So now that we've done that and we've given the network a moment to converge, let's do a show IP route for OSPF just to verify. And there we have it. So there's our 23 network. Look at the cost. It's 15. Now let's talk about that number just for a moment, 15. R2 has the cost of 10 associated with this interface. That's because we did the auto cost reference bandwidth. So it advertised, R2 did, its link state advertisement saying, oh, the cost for me to get to the 23 network is 10. R1 
got that information, and it knew that its local cost to reach R2 was 5 right here. So effectively, the cost of 10 and the cost of 5 is what this metric is all about. And if we had more links, we'd have to add all those up. And R1, when it crunched all the numbers and run the, ran the OSPF algorithm, decided that that was a much better path to get to this network than using dot thirty, forty, or 50. So for the 20 network, it's the same scoop. R2 is advertising about the 20 network. He's advertising it on this interface. He's also advertising it over here. But R1, because this interface has its locally lower cost, and that goes as part of the formula, R1's going to use this top interface as the path to get to the 20 network. So it's a good exercise. I appreciate you uh, walking through it with me. And that answers the question about somebody who said, Keith, can you make a video on OSPF and load balancing? We've identified manually setting the cost. We've also identified on the auto cost reference bandwidth example. And I do appreciate you watching. Have a great day.